Next speaker is Professor Ancancha. Sorry, Manon, I just butchered that. I apologize. Actually, shouldn't do that to a Georgia Tech grad. Uh, she got her bachelor's at uh, Texas A&M University at Qatar in uh, outside the beautiful city of Doha. Uh, Georgia Tech was trying to do a similar thing as Texas A&M back several years ago. So I visited that like a half dozen times. So it's a beautiful, beautiful town. I love that place. Um, but she's a Georgia Tech alum, both master's and PhD after getting out, which is what we call graduating here at Georgia Tech. She went on to uh, serve as a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and we were fortunate enough to recruit her back here into the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering. And Professor Manon, please take it away. All right, thank you again, Judd. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as Judd said, I'm Akanksha Menon. I'm a new assistant professor here at Georgia Tech. Started about seven months ago. Um, and my research group really is focused on developing energy efficient technologies um, for clean water, so desalination primarily. And then we're also looking at what we can do in the energy space primarily to decarbonize heat. So today I'll share a little bit about um, the work that we're doing, as well as some of the larger initiatives that are happening here at Georgia Tech. So because I'm an engineer, I like to start with the numbers, right? Um, so these are, you know, some numbers that are concerning. So you know, what I'm showing you is the energy consumption as electricity. Um, and you can see that in the next uh, couple of decades, as expected, energy consumption is going to grow. And you will see that the share of renewables still continues to be really, really small, right? So we are still primarily going to be reliant on fossil fuels to get our energy. The other uh, number that is probably even more concerning is if we look at the population um, on the globe over the next decade, what you see is that about half of the population is going to be living under severe water stress. Okay, so this means that more than half the population is not going to have access to fresh water. Okay, so the reason behind this is not that we have less energy or less water, right? We have oceans all around us, but it is really challenging to get that into a usable, usable form in places where we require it. And it requires a lot of energy in order to do that. So this is what the journey of our energy and water resources look like. There's a lot of information, but I'll try to walk you through it. So starting um, here on the left, we have our energy resource itself. Okay, so this is either your fossil fuels or a little bit of renewables. And then down here, the bottom half of this plot is looking at our water resources. So primarily it's fresh surface water and then some saline surface water. As our energy and water sources go through different conversion processes and utilization processes, at the end of it, a large amount is consumed. So in the case of energy, we use most of our primary energy use for transportation, um, for buildings, for industrial use, and then finally, some of that is consumed and a large amount is just wasted. Similarly, if we follow water, most of our water consumption is actually just for producing energy. Okay, we use a large amount of water for thermoelectric power plants in order to cool those power plants. And then of course we use some, uh, a good amount of water for agriculture as well. So at the end of this, you see that most of the water is discharged and a small amount of it is consumed. So really, I want you to focus on the end of these two charts, right, which is showing you that we started with some energy resource. At the end of it, we just dispose 60% of it as waste heat. We do something very similar with water. We started with our water resource, used it, but then we end up discharging 70% of that water we started with as waste water. Okay, so this linear model where we consume our resources and then just dump it is a cause for concern. 
And this is where I think material play a very big role in helping us envision new types of water systems and energy systems really in order for us to be able to recycle and reuse some of this waste and then send it back to the process itself. So this is uh, the role that materials can play in helping us get to a circular water economy and to reduce the amount of energy that we waste. So I'll focus now on how can we really get to a circular water economy. So here I'm showing you what's um, happening at Georgia Tech itself. So Georgia Tech was selected as part of this National Alliance for Water Innovation, which is a DOE-funded initiative, really to enable us to look at energy and water technologies together and to figure out how can we design the next generation energy and water technologies. So most of water treatment as it exists now and the infrastructure related to water treatment has existed for decades. Okay, so these are very old systems that use primarily fossil fuel to produce clean water. So this National Alliance for Water Innovation is really looking at how can we figure out what are the emerging water needs, what sectors require water, and then how do we focus on really innovations in that space to enable clean water technologies. And so this NAWI, National Alliance for Water Innovation, put out a series of roadmaps for different sectors. So there's the power industry, the extraction industry, oil and gas, municipal sector, as well as agricultural sector to look at what are the wastewater resources available and how do we purify this to produce uh, clean water. So Georgia Tech is involved um, in or has been involved in some of these road mapping efforts that were done. And really at the heart of it is coming up with new technologies that leverage advances in materials to replace some of these legacy um, water systems. So if we think about the power industry or oil and gas extraction, or even lithium extraction processes, all of them use what are called evaporation ponds and they look like these images. So these are you know, just large pools of wastewater which just sit out there and evaporate passively under natural sunlight. This process can take anywhere from six months to 24 or even in some cases 36 months to really evaporate this wastewater. And so what we've been looking at is really how can we improve the performance of this very passive system, not only to produce clean water, but also to extract some resources from this. So a lot of work was done in looking at using photothermal materials. Okay, so these are materials which will take in sunlight, convert it into heat, and really localize the heat where evaporation is occurring. And so that way, instead of heating a large volume, you're really just focusing on heating the area where evaporation occurs. So these are some lab scale prototypes, and you can see generally what they comprise of are a porous um, material that's a very strong absorber of solar energy. So a lot of times, these are carbon-based um, porous materials or uh, graphite, graphene oxide based. And then you need an insulating foam, which in many cases is a polymeric um, foam. And the reason for the insulating foam is really just to separate that top surface from the bulk of the liquid itself. And so finally, then you need a hydrophilic material that's gonna transport water from the bulk to the surface where evaporation occurs. So this is how you would design a photothermal converter. A lot of the prototypes and literature that I'm showing here are carbon-based foams, like I said, and in some cases there have also been some biologically inspired. So this was, you know, a mushroom which went through a carbonization process to help it become a better solar absorber, and the water transport in the mushroom is naturally designed in a way that allows you to get this kind of photothermal wicking. It's a natural mushroom, yes. Just a regular mushroom, which was carbonized to give it a very high solar absorption. So the idea here is that we really just want to localize the heat where we need it. Okay, so that's where the evaporation is happening rather than heating a large volume of the liquid itself. 
Now we can extend this idea of doing solar evaporation, not just for producing clean water, but also to extract resources from, from the wastewater streams. So resources could be you know, metals that are in the wastewater. It could also be salts um, that would find application in other industries. And it can also be nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, um, and different other nutrients. So there is a lot of work um, happening here at Georgia Tech um, in the space of how do we do resource recovery from wastewater streams? So from oil and gas, wastewater, how can we really extract materials of interest? So here I'm showing you a very simple prototype of a three-dimensional structure. Again, that same porous solar absorber concept, but now it's scaled up to three dimensions. And what you see is if you continuously evaporate the water, at the end of the process, you have salts which will precipitate on the surface. So this is one potential option to do lithium extraction from seawater, for example, a very passive um, process. And because lithium and sodium have very different solubilities, you could extract that uh, differences in solubility in order to get um, lithium precipitation. Again, this relies on designing your material very, with very specific characteristics. Uh, so in this case, it used a cotton um, stick and the cotton was functionalized with graphene oxide to really give it this uh, solar absorbing properties. But you can see here the graphene oxide really just coats the outer surface. So the inside of the stick still maintains the properties of the cotton, which is what is it allowing it to really pull up the water um, in order to get evaporation. So we can really use these types of functional materials to get to resource recovery as well. So every time we talk about desalination and water treatment, it's not just to produce the clean water, but it is also to extract different resources that we can get from wastewater streams. And the ultimate goal really is this idea of zero liquid discharge. So zero liquid discharge is essentially trying to develop technologies where you extract all the water from a wastewater stream so that, that you have to dispose. So this is not only good from an environmental standpoint uh, because you don't have to dispose wastewater, but also you can extract these different resources that are present in the wastewater. We can continue um, to really modify the surfaces to give us different types of precipitation and allow us to extract different resources. So here what I'm showing you is essentially modifying the surface material by creating hierarchical roughness. So what this allows you to do is if you have a combination of micro and nanoscale roughness on surfaces, you can really create hydrophobic and superhydrophobic surfaces that prevent the salt from precipitating at the surface and also promote the water to roll off from the surface. You can get very high contact angles with these modified surfaces. And as you can see here, as soon as you deposit a droplet, it beads up and it really does not spread on these modified surfaces. Do so you get almost like this rolling off uh, behavior from these hydrophobic and superhydrophobic surfaces. There's also really interesting um, behavior with the salt itself. If these modified surfaces are subjected to a temperature gradient, what you find is that the salt crystals start to form these legs. And over time, those legs grow long enough that the salt crystal is essentially ejects itself from the surface. So now, you know, you're not only preventing the water droplets from sticking to the surface, but even if any salt does form on your surface, it is going to eject itself from that surface because you've performed the surface modification. So these are really um, interesting things that have come out of the desalination world, but you could apply this to the design of heat exchangers, right, where you really want to avoid salt uh, precipitation and corrosion of any kind on those surfaces. So in my group, we're working um, with Professor Dennis Hess and Mark Lasego's groups here at Georgia Tech and really looking at how can we modify these surfaces, not just the morphology with this micro nanotexturing, but also the surface chemistry. 
uh, in order to get this kind of salt lift off and water roll off behavior um, for desalination applications. So I showed you about using these porous photothermal converters in order to um, evaporate water. So in that case, you're essentially wicking the water up to the surface. But we can also design these non-contact photothermal converters, which never really touch the surface of water, but still accomplish the same goal. So here I'm showing you that same evaporation pond. Um, and as sunlight comes to the surface of the pond, essentially it heats up that full volume because sunlight is a very, or water is a very poor absorber of um, sunlight. But what we see is that water really becomes a good absorber in the mid infrared. So what if we took the sunlight, converted it into different wavelengths in the mid infrared, and that way water would inherently very strongly absorb the incoming radiation and keep it all at the surface. So you no longer need that insulating foam or the capillary wicking. So here we look at transforming the solar into the mid infrared using these photothermal converters. So these are selective solar absorbers and um, selective emitters that are designed essentially using, um, using these coating processes in order to get conversion from this visible, primarily visible solar into the mid infrared. And you can see as a result of that, all the heat that's coming in is going to stay at the surface of the water. It gets to a high temperature and it has a much higher evaporation. So this is another way of getting to the zero liquid discharge. These are salts that have precipitated out once all of that water has evaporated. And in this case, there's no contact. As you can see, it just sits on top of the body that you're evaporating from. So in ME, we have Professor Zhu and Zhang's group that designs a lot of these uh, materials with very specific radiative properties. And we can utilize the selective emitters and absorbers to really get us to zero liquid discharge. So beyond these more evaporative type of processes, we can also use materials um, for a combination of membrane and thermal processes. So that's what I'm showing you here. So here, this process is a membrane combined with a thermal process. It's referred to as forward osmosis. And so the first step, essentially, you have your wastewater on one side, and you have a more concentrated solution on the other side. So it's going to draw the water across the membrane. That's just regular osmosis. And then if you choose your draw material to be such that it can very easily heat up and separate from the water, then we can get um, a full cycle. So we use these thermally responsive ionic liquids, which exhibit a very interesting phase behavior in water. So they have a critical temperature above which they will phase separate from the water. At room temperature, they're fully mixed with the water, as you can see here. But if we heat that up by about five or 10 degrees Celsius, you can get the two layers to phase separate. And so really here, what we're saying is let's look at new phase transitions beyond um, the more traditional liquid vapor phase transition. So these are liquid-liquid phase transitions to really enable us to do desalination. So these are some of the different ionic liquids. Um, these are being synthesized by Professor John Reynolds' lab here in chemistry. And the most interesting part is that this phase behavior requires a very, very subtle balance of hydrophobic and hydrophilic functional groups in your ionic liquid. So for example, with this structure, one of these metal groups, the ionic liquid no longer exhibits that phase behavior. So it's a very, very small um, balance of hydrophobic and hydrophilic that gives us that critical uh, temperature. So this is just showing you as we heat um, the material, you can see that it undergoes this milky transition. And then once it is fully heated, you can see it's separating into two distinct layers with the ionic liquid 
and the water being those two layers. And it follows that phase diagram. So we're trying to understand how can we really design these materials um, to give us this, this, this critical transition behavior. And so this requires really understanding how the water interacts with the different functional groups in the ionic liquid. So here we're working with um, Jesse McDaniel's group in chemistry again, um, and they're doing some molecular dynamics uh, in order to not only help understand, but also predict new materials that could potentially show this kind of um, phase transition. So with that, I'll just change gears a little bit and talk about some additional um, applications for these different types of functional materials. So we've, we've heard a lot about decarbonizing electricity and decarbonizing the electric grid, but there's also a big need to decarbonize heat, and this has received a, a lot less attention. So if we look at the uh, residential sector or just the building sector in general, you will see that a large amount of the energy consumption in buildings is primarily in the form of heat. And so what we're interested in is developing thermal batteries, um, just like we have lithium ion and other electrochemical batteries. So the way we do that is we use these reversible thermochemical reactions. So here I'm showing you what would be like the charging step for your battery. So you have a hydrated salt, which once you drive uh, heat through it, it goes through an endothermic reaction where the salt dehydrates. You get the dehydrated salt and you're left with water vapor. We can then run the reverse reaction, which is you introduce water vapor to the dehydrated salt, which will combine. That reaction is exothermic and then that reaction will release so we're looking at storing energy as heat by running these reversible solid gas chemical reactions. A lot of work has been done in identifying hundreds of different salts that can do these types of reactions at several different temperatures and which have sufficient energy densities. But these are purely theoretical or thermodynamic analysis, and they don't really take into account what happens to the salt as you keep cycling it as it goes undergoes dehydration and then hydration. So what we've been focused on is really how do we get reversible uh, thermochemical reactions. So this is the salt after one cycle, after a couple more cycles, you can see that there's several more cracks that are formed. The microstructure starts changing significantly. So in theory, the reactions are reversible, but in practice, we see the structure change significantly. So we're looking at stabilizing these materials by developing organic inorganic composites where the salts are held in place by an organic uh, matrix, which acts as a scaffold. This is work that we're doing with Professor Yu Hang Hu's group here at Georgia Tech. They develop a lot of hydrogel materials for primarily for mechanics and materials applications. And these gels have been shown to be like self-healable. So we want to now use the self-healable gels um, in this type of system so that even if there is cracking as you cycle the material, the gel can heal itself. And we also look at how can we use a lot of the um, infrastructure that's been developed around characterizing electrochemical batteries, especially in situ techniques, and applying it to developing these thermal batteries. And then just to finish, I will introduce one other um, area that we're looking at where, again, materials play a very important role. So here we're looking at how can you use materials in order to do personal thermoregulation or do energy harvesting um, in just from around us. So we use thermoelectrics um, for this. Again, it requires P and N type semiconductors similar to solar cells but they have to have a much higher uh, electrical conductivity in this case. The traditional thermoelectrics, you know, it's been around for decades, uses these inorganic rigid um, materials to form devices of this form factor. And what we've been focusing on at Georgia Tech really is how can we instead move towards organic thermoelectrics, which are solution processable and will allow us to do large scale manufacturing and also create very flexible and stretchable 
devices. So here are a couple of um, examples of some of the work that we've done. So here we've printed thousands of these organic thermoelectric materials onto a regular commercially available sportswear fabric. And essentially you can use this for body heat harvesting. So you would produce electricity just using the temperature difference between our body and the ambient. And we've also been looking at using 3D printing to create flexible heat sinks, um, which can be added to these devices to increase the performance further, and also to give you personal cooling. So you could wear um, a wristband that's actually just cooling your body once we pass a little bit of electricity through it. And then working closely with Professor John Reynolds' group and um, Thad Stanner's group at the College of Computing, They've taken some of these thermoelectric materials and used it to power an electric chromic display. And so in this case, your thermoelectric powers the electrochromic, and so you can use it to create interactive displays. And so these are, again, just some of the different applications that are being enabled by using solution processable uh, polymer thermoelectrics that we've developed here at Georgia Tech. So with that, um, what we've traditionally seen with energy and water systems are very large scale static systems that rely on a lot of mechanical components. And to me, the future is one in which we change um, these to be much more efficient and dynamic systems and that are enabled by using smart materials that are harnessing energy, whether it's solar energy or ambient energy around us and the materials are at the heart of making this transition to the more dynamic systems. And with that, I just want to acknowledge um, my group, as well as some collaborators at Berkeley Lab where some of this work was done, and the facilities that we've used for a lot of the materials characterization. So thank you, and I'm ha happy to take any questions. Questions from our audience? I've got one concern in the water technologies. A lot of those seem like they'd be applicable to either large municipal scale water or possibly like personal man portable ones for disaster response or camping or something along those lines. Can you differentiate the two? Which ones would be better for large scale applications versus kind of smaller survival almost applications? Yeah, so a lot of the operation type of ones that I showed you more amenable on the scale, um, whereas the combination of the hybrid membrane and solar technology, which could use these ionic liquids, that is something that could be applied at a much larger scale. Thank you. Any further questions? Let's check online. Professor Manon, thank you very much. Appreciate it.